You just pressed play on the Last Breath Hunt Cast, home of the Hunterversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 159 of the Last Breath Hunt Cast, presented by Badlands Gear. Using the code LASTBREATH 22 bl 30 you can receive 30% off site-wide anything to your heart's desire on BadlandsGear.com. They've got really everything from ever, everything that you would need to outfit your hunt, other than, I guess, boots, arrows, and the weapon that you are going to take into the woods with you. They've got bibs, which are extremely warm. I cannot recommend the Pyre suit enough. That is the favorite piece of camo that I personally have ever owned. Their base layer system, they're stepping up with that. And they also have a lot of like really nice lifestyle gear. I know I mentioned last podcast about the scree pants. Those are my favorite pants. I have literally five pairs of them, one in every color that they make. And then a double in the tan because I really like those ones for wearing them to work. So um, go check those guys out at badlandsgear.com. And uh, they just got really everything. And like I said, 30% off, that's pretty substantial. And uh, whenever we go and tell these partners that we have on our podcast, hey, we'd like a discount code. We like it to be more than 5, 10, or 15 or something like piddly, like free shipping. While that's great, that's awesome. We wanted something more substantial so that would actually help you out. So, um, you know, 30 bucks off every 100 bucks you spend there. That's not too bad. That's some good jingle, man. Yep. Um. Moving on to Outdoor Edge. Outdoor Edge is another great partner of ours. Using the code LBTV25, 25% off. And you think about that, like a lot of their cutlery pieces don't break the bank. Nope. You know, um, And if you are one of the guys or gals that have invested in one of their knives, you can usually use this to save 25% on the replacement blades. They mm-hmm. have a couple new offerings of replacement blades now. They continue to develop that line with different types of points, you know, drop points, skinning knife. They've got a fillet knife now. They've got a gut hook now. And I feel like they're going to continue to evolve that replacement blade line to make mm-hmm. it more diverse for their customers. So whether you just need a new knife. If you need a field knife, a skinning knife, a boning knife, maybe you want to get somebody a whole new butcher kit for a present. They make fantastic molded sealed kits that you can take on hunts or you can take on fishing trips. Um, Mm -hmm. 25% off using the code LBTV25. Finally, our last one here is actually the podcast focus of today, the Exodus MMT. So big shout out to Jake and Chad for sending us over some MMTs. The MMT and what Exodus has been known for for the last, you know, five, six years is their stellar trail camera quality. However, they have launched into the aerospace and the MMT is uh, just as solidly built as their trail cameras are known to be. And we got our arrows the other day. Um, they're already pre-cut, everything like that in the box. When you get them, they're ready to screw the field tip into and shoot immediately. They even spine index them for you. So that I think is just an extra touch that is very impressive. You can check those guys out at out exodusoutdoorgear.com and find out even more but that's what we're going to be laying on you thick today that's the topic is the exodus mmt kind of your and i's arrow journey over the last like decade uh some of the things that we've gotten our asses burned on some of the things that have worked really well and why we think the exodus mmt is going to be one of those things that uh is going to stay in the quiver for a very long time well, and before we kick it off, there's two other people I want to shout out. One is the beautiful man, Mike Lemansky, diehard listener and follower, good friend of ours. I know he's listening right now. So Mike Lemansky, check him out, Harvest Time Hunt on Instagram. And then our boy Cody Jenkins over at Whitetail Legacy Podcast. Dude is an unknown whitetail assassin. You should listen to his podcast. You should check him out on Instagram. And now we're going to take you through the process of the Exodus MMT. What we want to do for you today is give you a rundown of the arrows, talk about the evolution of how we have adopted this insane idea of diving deep into arrow building. And then also, like if you're a potential customer, what you plan to experience when you build your arrows. So thanks for listening and hold on. All right, so I've got a Exodus MMT right here, fresh out of the box, and I'm just going to give you my 
two minute unboxing overview. Grant's going to give you his. So I want to start with the packaging. I feel like that's such an important part in today's consumer experience. Um, the, Exodus does a great job on packaging. They Ooh, do. La, la. They do. Like uh, our arrows came individually packaged. They were packaged in foam to make sure that none of the arrows were touching, none of the fletchings were touching, no damage from shipping. And usually when you order a dozen arrows from somebody, They're you get tight. the bear shaft and like maybe a rubber band thrown around them or something like that. But these all came fletched, so that's pretty nice. Yep, we're going to get into that. Actually, all the MMTs come pre-fletched, but even... Like the just the box volume footprint size is significantly larger than like let's say you order a dozen Carbon Express or Gold Tips. Like the boxes are adequate, yeah, but th the fletchings are all touching. And being a neat freak type A like me, I I know that they will bounce back if they have a little memory, but I don't want that with a new shaft. Um, also, looking at the arrows, they feel. They just feel good in the hand. And I know that kind of sounds cliche, but the carbon weave is incredibly smooth as you run your hand over it. I appreciate the fact that the MMT stamp, the decal that's on there is white. It's going to be great for any type of hunting application where you want to check for blood. The fletchings, um, being a guy that builds my own arrows, you know, I'm looking, there's no excess glue. Um, they're not, they're not lightly glued down but they're not heavy like things that i look for on other people's arrows when i see them um, you're going to notice that there's going to be a white mark for your spine indicator which they spine these i don't know if they did high spine or low spine but regardless uh, they have the cock vein to the high spine or the spined indicator so your arrows are all going to fly the same and then coming down here to the insert uh, the arrow was cut symmetrically uh, you know you can see sometimes on arrow builds if you look if the saw isn't straight you'll actually have a little bit of space in between the insert and the carbon. This is a full seat. Uh, I don't see any any glue, any insert glue that's protruding. So the build, like I said, my two, three minute out of the box overview is pretty darn good. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> looking at the fletchings, I think this is an interesting thing to know. And like the scientific aspect behind these arrows, just because I talk to Jake very regularly, um, and you know, he's obviously one of the co-owners and partners of Exodus. Um, they just, it, it feels like it's engineered very well. Like you said, I'm looking at the glue, I'm looking at the insert, I'm looking at the fletching, just the arrow overall gives like a very high quality feel. Like whoever fletched this and built this arrow did a good job, took their time and it was done carefully. Like you said, um, and that's ultimately like why I started. That's a to, big deal. It is a big deal. Little details that make a big deal. Yeah, that's right, man. And like when we first yep. started hunting, we'd buy like pre-fletched arrows or we'd have archery shops fletch them. And again, being the type of people that we are, you look at them like, oh man, that's got a clump of glue here. Or like, <laughs> like when I fletch my own arrows, when I build my own arrows, always make sure. Like I literally take a Q-tip and wipe the excess glue off of each vein. Mm -hmm. before I go on to the next one. That's just who I am. And I can tell somebody did the same thing with this. So Yeah. And the fleshings are straight, but we're looking at the website right here, and they call this airfoil technology. Yep. So it's kind of interesting. Basically, if you open up an Exodus MMT that they have fletched for you, the fletching is our straight on the shaft. There's no helical made and created with the glue and like a Bitsenberger jig or anything like that. But... I mean, how would you explain that? There is a cut and groove, like an indent and... Well, uh, so it's not necessarily a cut. Uh, not we'll a cut. We'll back it up to normal cut. fletching. Typically, you will either put a right or a left helical on your arrow fletchings to give the arrow spin and flight. <clears throat> now, mm -hmm. you can go as a deep into seeing which way your bow wants to spin that. You take a bear shaft, you mark it, and you can find if your bow wants to spin without fletchings, if it wants to twist the arrow right or left. Well... What you do to do that is you literally put the curve in the vein. Like the jig will have a small helical, a curve that puts the vein glued onto your shaft with a twist. With these airfoil veins, it's a straight fletch. So the, the fletchings themselves sit perfectly perpendicular, parallel, or parallel right, mm -hmm. on, the on the shaft. But these veins <clears throat> have been stamped to have, like you said, an indentation and a bulge. And that is going to create the same effect as a helical. I'm excited Without to try the these. noise. That's what I was just going to say. Without the noise. So they're supposed to create that rotation with less drag and less noise. So 
the technology in my mind is there, right? I'm, I'm like mm-hmm. thinking, man, this is going to be pretty badass to try. I also like that these airfoil veins are very rigid. Mm-hmm. I I prefer a rigid vein. It's just my preference. There's I wish I had some big scientific spiel to tell you why, but like Boeing X veins have been ones that I've always kind of reached over and, and liked just because they have a little bit more of a rigidity feel than like a blazer vein. And these ones are even more rigid. Mm -hmm. I think it also has to do so they can maintain that, that profile, that stamp Mm -hmm. to create the rotation. But, um, yeah, I mean, you pair these, if these are as quiet as, as a lot of people are saying they are, you put that with the new Matthews V threes that the V three X's that we have, like this thing's going to be a quiet killer, you know? Yeah. Um, let's talk about the experience now. So, okay. you, you bit. You go, all right, I've heard enough about these. I've seen them at work. Like, I want to go and and buy some of these. So the shopping experience is a lot different than other aero manufacturers that are out there. When you go to Exodus's website and you go to the MMT tab, you're going to find that there's at the top of the page a, a detailed drop-down menu about the components, the efficiency, um, essentially the arrows themselves. We're going to get back to that, but I want to talk about the shopping experience. So you scroll down, you've done your research, and you actually build your arrows to suit. So if you are an archer that wants to up your arrow game, but maybe you don't have a saw or you don't have a fletching dig or both. It's cool. They'll do it for you. They do it for you. So the cost of this arrow is actually to get it delivered to your house ready to shoot. You literally place the order. It is cut to size, fletched, inserts are glued in, spined, etc. I mean, you pull them out of the box, you put a broad head or a field point on, and you put them in your bow. So you can either pick dozen or half dozen. You then have to pick your draw weight, your draw length, your point weight, your let off factor, which is interesting to me. And then dropping down to the components, you can pick your inserts, aluminum or brass, or you can, and you can pick your knocks. They have three different knock options. Then they have a build time option, and then there's a spine option. So when you go into building these arrows, you need to do a little bit of research to find out what your bow is, like let off, poundage, draw uh, length. And then from that, you build it. And I mean, the, the longest shipping time, let me tell you this, the longest shipping time on their site right now is ships within five days. Mm-hmm. So include a couple days for shipping. You're talking five to probably eight days, maybe nine days if the post office or FedEx guy, however they send it out, drags their feet. But I mean, you're, you're talking less than two weeks from order to delivery at your door and probably quite a bit less than that. But they also have next day and they also have two to three days shipping. So if you're in a bind and you're like, dude, I need these arrows right away, you have that ability. Literally, if you, you know, you're, you're, you're hunting somewhere, you need arrows, and all of a sudden you're like, I don't have any of my equipment or I don't have the ability to do it, the bow shop's lead time is 10 days out because it's hunting season. They're slammed with bow repairs and other stuff. You have this option here that if you're especially already set up with these arrows to have fresh batch arrows yep. next day. And bail you right out. Crazy. <clears throat> Talking about price too, looking at the dozen right now on the website, $239. And I just wanted to bring something up um, about that just because normally when you go to a bow shop, you know, I've bought about three different arrows in my hunting career um, by various different brands. And typically, you know, that dozen when you go and purchase in a shop, if they're on the lower quality end, they'll be like a seven to eight dollars per arrow type deal. And if they're, you know, on the higher quality end, you may pay like up to one eighty. So I wanted to talk about the price at two thirty nine and mention <clears throat> that if you brought if you bought twelve arrows from another um, arrow manufacturer, typically they don't come pre-fletched. So if you don't have a Bitsenberger jig and all the stuff and the knowledge and the know-how to how to fletch your arrows, you're going to have to go to a bow shop anyway. In fact, last summer I took some of my gold tip arrows in, uh, to be fletched at a local shop and to fletch like eight arrows, um, the way that I wanted to, um, it was about $65. Right. Um, so, so I wanted to bring that up because, you know, on the onset, you could say, oh, I'm just going to go to a bow shop and I'm going to get these done there. Well, number one, bow shops, not very many of them are going to spine test your arrows, which these all are. Number two, you're not going to get them built for exactly what you need per 
the website. So I just felt like I wanted to mention the fact that, yeah, are these a little bit more expensive? They sure are. However, not really. You, you, they're getting built. You do not have any middleman. You're cutting out the middleman. You're cutting out the bow shop, which, you know, that could be good. That could be bad, depending on how your economic policy and, you know, philosophy is. But well, Exodus is but, still a small business. It's yeah, not like you're buying from business. some giant umbrella company. Yeah, correct. Here's what it comes down to. The MMTs at the price point, the MMTs are a premium arrow. Mm -hmm. They're classified as that. If you look at any arrow manufacturer and you get into their top tier arrows, like no, here, I'm going to give right you now. an example. Okay. These are arrows that we've shot in the past. We had a lot of success. Not, not knocking these arrows. Great mm -hmm. arrows. Yep. Gold tip, kinetic, pierce, platinums. Okay. That's going to get you similar straightness, similar weight tolerances to these MMTs. And the bear shafts, a dozen, are $190. Mm -hmm. That's uncut, unfletched. That's, you know, 190 bucks. No inserts, See, no knocks. It comes with inserts and knocks. Oh, okay. They, they come with the components, not the fletching. Mm -hmm. But again, you need to either put those on or pay somebody to put them on. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what you're doing, you still have to fletch them. Like you got the time, gas to run and go, drop them off, pick them up. I'm just talking Everything about like, like too. let's say you have a, a jig and mm -hmm. you have a saw. Cool. You're like me, right? You want to do it. I mean, veins aren't like, it's not like they're Breaking five the bucks a dozen. Is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Like you have, you have expenses into doing it. So the mm -hmm. saw you've bought that already. Okay, we're not going to count that. The jig you bought that already. We're not going to count that. I'm talking from 190 on. You have the cost of your veins themselves, which veins aren't cheap, especially nice veins. Yep. Like, like they're not. And then you have the glue itself. Like a little bottle of vein tech glue that I use. It's like 15 bucks, mm -hmm. and it'll do two, a lot of two and a half dozen. Mm -hmm. You know. But you have to think you, when you buy the fletchings. You don't just buy a dozen fletching. No, you have to buy three dozen because you have three for each arrow, right? Mm -hmm. So there's added expenses or secondary and tertiary costs into making your arrow, even if you buy them, right? Yep. So that $240 price point, it would be hard for me to buy these shafts and fletch them for 40 bucks to match this. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're doing it all professionally for you. It's yeah. taking all the guesswork and the time out. And the yeah. time. And fletching is a time consuming thing. Oh, hell yeah. Cutting your arrows and Watching putting your glue your dry. Into, <laughs> yeah. You know, I bet it takes, yeah. I bet it's about five minutes an arrow. Yeah. Easy. So, I mean. Unless you're a seasoned pro. Even if you are, I mean, shoot, that's, that's being, I mean, I'm no guru by any means. Talk to Mike Lomansky. That guy, bow nut. Yep. I don't know how fast Mike can fletch arrows, but if you know Mike, Put me down in the comments in the inner circle and be like, you suck. If you're not fletching an arrow in under three minutes, you're a big bitch. <laughs> but uh, I bet it's about five minutes for me. And that's me using, well, I, and, I, and again, here's another thing. Like, right, I, I'd be curious to see the process of how these fletch, they fletch these. But I prime every one of my veins. Use a little primer pen from AE. Mm -hmm. I prime every vein so I make sure I have good adhesion. Then I wipe all the veins. It's probably more than five minutes. I bet you I spend two, two and a half minutes a vein. When it's all said and done, like if you timed me from when I had the vein in my hand to when I primed it, put glue on it, put it in the jig, clamped it, let it cure, take it out, wipe it off, and move on to the next one. So what are you? What are, what are some other cool details we want to go over? Uh, I feel like the specs, I feel like I've really in the last like five or six years after I've got burned once or twice, have really paid attention to the GPI, which is grains per inch. And on the Exodus MMT 300s, that is, it's a GPI of 9.8 per inch. So it is on the heavier side. It is not a, it it's is not a speed not arrow. A speed arrow. But it's there are a couple arrows that, you know, like the Bloodsport Onyx that are closer 12. to that, like, yeah, 11, 12 mark. So this one's in the what I would call the upper middle of weight. It's not the heaviest arrow out there, but it's definitely not a light arrow either. Um, and, you know, if you round up 9.8 to 10, multiply that by your arrow length, which for lots of us listening tonight is 29 or 30 inches probably i mean there's 300 grains right there you add another 100 for your broadhead now you're sitting at 400 pretty easily now you got your knocks possibly grains Inserts. up front which they put in there for you 30 grains of brass or 10 grains of aluminum correct and so now you pretty close to that like magical number of 450 480 range which a lot of people that are way smarter than me and way better and more knowledgeable in this space especially dealing with arrows that they say that's like a really sweet number to be around. It's 
it's literally my goal. I, I've, I built some arrows for a friend of mine, Brandon Connor, and he had the same issues, right? We can, we should talk about our arrow builds in the past because yep. we've been all over. I have been all over the board mm-hmm. and, uh, he's like, Hey man, he's like, can you help me out and build me some arrows? He's like, I'm just, I don't get pass throughs. And he's like, I never have blah, blah, blah. And immediately he goes, I think I need to be like in that 600 range. Whoa. Let's see where this comes from. There's a lot of high, there's, there is a, it's kind of like, and they're good guys, great guys, do your thing. But it's kind of like the public land mobile hunters. Those guys are a niche market. Like they have a very cool mindset. They're going to do it their way. Same thing with the hair, like the heavy arrow crew. You know, the guys are like, you need to be shooting grid sticks, 200 grains up front. If you don't have 57% FOC, you're fucked. Like, yeah. And they're they're literally, yep. they're building cinder blocks to shoot. And it works. They, they kill shit with them. Mm-hmm. Not for me. My sweet spot, like you were saying, 485 to 525. That's me drawing 75 pounds with a 29-inch draw. I think mm-hmm. if you're in that 70-pound range, my personal belief is like, like I said, that 475 to 525 is a really good yep. happy medium of speed, kinetic energy, and momentum. Exodus has done this. That's the thing that I think is so cool is watching Chad specifically shoot arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow and just cataloging all this data mm-hmm. and being like, I think we figured it out. Like we have an arrow that's perfect for hunting most of your mid-sized game, you know, whitetail, mule deer, antelope, pigs, elk, you know, stuff like that. So talking about our journey, remember when I bought my first Matthews bow? Yes. That's the exact opposite of what we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. I had the East and the Flatline arrows. They were 7.2 grains an inch. Light as a feather. Oh, man. And I remember like people would not believe me. This was 12 years ago that my Matthews was shooting 300 feet a second. Mm-hmm. Like, no way. Like, there ain't no fucking way you're shooting real 300. I'm like, yeah, I'm like 330. And then they chrono, and they're like, holy shit. Now, I killed deer with that setup. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But, like, it that was, bow was awesome. It was the lightest freaking hunting setup I've ever had. Mm-hmm. Little blazer veins on the back. Some of my stuff, I didn't even use lighted knocks. They were cut. Like, I didn't have a quarter inch to spare out of my rest. I mean, they were light. They shot fast. And as you said, we learned through the years, two holes are better than one. Two holes are better than one. What are we doing wrong? Like we need two holes. We need that exit hole. We want that other, we want that other hole for blood trailing, for animal dispatch, you name it. Like I need that, I need that pass through. And so we shot Carbon Express for several years. I shot gold tip. I made that switch first to gold tip. Mm-hmm. I started to like look into stuff and I'm like, okay. Back in like 2017 is when you flopped over. Yeah. And I was about a year and I was a season and a half behind you. And I was just, you know, you kind of start playing and tinkering and, and here we are now, right? Mm -hmm. Like we overanalyze everything. Yep. And now the deer that you like, let's look at Buster. I bet you went through 40 inches of meat because of the way that he was quartered. Yeah. And you right through him. Yeah. I mean, the arrow fell out, I don't know, 20 yards after impact. He was holding on by the fletchings on the. On the off side. Off side, yeah. But I mean, but it wasn't like a perfect broadside shot. Like, dude was curled around, mm-hmm. tense, yep. all through all that stuff. Like, yeah, you stopped and everything. I'm excited to see how these perform, man. Yeah. And I don't feel like we've covered this yet, but this um, this Exodus MMT, this 300 spine that we have, it's not a micro diameter shaft. It's like a standard shaft arrow. And I felt like we haven't covered that yet. And I feel like micro shafts are really, really hot right now. Um, but... In terms of that durability that the uh, micro shafts are known for, Exodus with the standard shaft and the MMT have kind of gotten around that with their durability because the one-to-one weave ratio, um, kind of doing some reading and investigating about these, Jake was trying to explain it to me, but it was uh, fairly complicated and I don't remember 100% like verbatim what he said, so I will just say this. The outside of the weave, like the carbon weave that is encapsulating the carbon shaft on the inside, is apparently several times stronger than a micro diameter straight carbon shaft. 
um, because of the way that the carbon is woven. And I was busy kind of, as you were talking about that about 10 minutes ago, I was busy like flexing it. And I feel like that's where outdoorsmen like myself included, when you get a busted arrow, I feel like that's where you get into trouble. You don't get a ton of impact on the shot. You put it where it needs to be like behind the shoulder. And then a deer is getting out of Dodge. They shear it off. Well, this being a very, like an extremely tough arrow, I feel like is going to curb a lot of that. Uh, in the end, just because of how durable it is. I think this Which is, is cool. Uh, maybe I don't want to overpromise, but I believe that you will probably have two holes with this arrow. But I think if you don't, as you're saying, like, let's say you get and you're stuck in maybe the offside shoulder. Yeah. It's, I think that's important to not have that arrow break off because then as that deer's running, your broadhead's doing extra work, mm-hmm. right? If that, if the broadhead is lodged inside the body cavity and you don't have that arrow break off, it's just chilling in there. It's laying and it's, if the arrow breaks off, yeah, it's yeah, just it's sitting there. But if it's sticking out chop, and it chop, doesn't chop. break, yeah, that's like an, a hatchet in there. Just yep. And so to further your statement, most arrow manufacturers, when they make a, a straight carbon arrow, it's extruded, it's extruded on a line. And what Exodus has, they have the core of their arrow, which is an extruded carbon arrow, and then they have it weaved on the outside. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's... Uh, it's like to, a full metal, ja- full metal jacket it, wrapped. In my mind, it's like... Equivalent for a bullet. Like if anybody's out there handy and you've got your water connection to your sink or to your toilet, you can buy just like the regular plastic PVC one, right? Mm-hmm. But you can also upgrade and get like the stainless steel weave on the outside of it. That's what this is to me. You mm-hmm. have... The That's integrity of, of the center, it. but you have the strength of the weave on the outside. It, I think this is going to help it stay stronger, but it's also going to stabilize faster out of your bow, which having a stable arrow means better flight, which mm-hmm. means improved accuracy and more better energy transfer. Yeah. So I, I don't know. And I, they speak about that on the website as well, that these are four times faster tuning arrows than yes. it's than predecessing arrows and competitive arrow brands. So I think that that's a, a big selling point just because, you know, uh, all of us, you know, most, most of the, it's no secret, most of the people that hunt are, you know, employed individuals and members of the working class in some way or another. And so time is of the essence. And if you have an arrow that's tuning itself four times quicker than others, I mean, that's, I feel like a big, a big deal to make sure. And they're spine indexing them for you as well. Like they've taken a lot of the guesswork out so that you just have to grip it and rip it. They show up, screw your field point and you can go to the range within 30 seconds of them showing up at your door and uh, you know we keep talking about the build quality here but they do a lot of things that other other bow shops and arrow manufacturers don't do just talking about spining Mm -hmm. to spine an arrow you put an arrow in a device the device puts a certain amount of pressure on the shaft and you will roll the shaft because it will have a it's called a high and a low or a strong and a weak where the arrow will flex its most and then flex its least (coughs) and so if if you fletch your arrows to have your veins oriented in the same way, whether it's the strong spine or the weak spine, when that arrow flies out of the bow, it's going to wobble the same. So mm-hmm. typically your arrow is going to wobble from weak to strong, right? Like left to right, kind of like a fish swimming. If you slow it down and watch an arrow. So the, mm-hmm. the reason why you have even better accuracy and easy, easy ability to tune this is like your arrow, whether it's flying up and down, left to right, horizontal, you know, cockeyed 45, it's yep. doing that at the same time because your arrows are all spined that way. Yep. So that only helps with your tunability. And, and just like you said, man, I mean, the people that love building their bows and tinkering around with them and playing with their setups, you still do this. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, I got the Exodus MMTs. I don't need to tune my bow. Right. <laughs> wing it like no you still do that you just have a much more enjoyable process it takes a tremendous amount of guesswork out like the difference between you and me like you are very much so into gear very much so in tune with like tinkering especially when it comes to like the weapons you use me i just kind of want to go out there and hunt and for people like me this is a money arrow like you're going to be able to order this all of that guesswork is done for you um so all you have to do is go sight that bad boy in and you can you know start hunting as soon as you're comfortable with the groups that you're getting which like you said every arrow is going to fly very close to the same because they've taken that guesswork out of the equation in the front end of their build process which i think that is like an extra little added touch that is just 
Like I said earlier, those little things that add up, the packaging, the look of the arrow, the fact that it's spined, the fact that when you hold it, there's not glue all over the place and all over creation. I feel like those little things and the fact that these are coming tailored to you, built, ready to rock and roll, takes a lot of guesswork out of it. And I think that's awesome for people that are like me. Yeah. And I so. and, and just like we talked about, at a price point that's right there, if not more competitive than some of the other premium arrows that are out there. So Yep. I here's the scoop. Check them out. You're going to see these probably all over the hunting industry. You know, in this a matter fall, of time, um, mm-hmm. people are going to start killing stuff with them. You're going to start seeing how effective they are. Um, there's a ton of, of videos that are up on YouTube from on Exodus's channel. You know, as you watch these guys develop the arrows and shoot them, uh, the backstory, the backlog. There's a lot of information if you're thinking about it. But I guess. Even if got I got some, some kill shots up there too. Jakester, he as they were getting ready to launch the MMT and Cameron was building the brand video for it, he's like, Hey, you mind if we get some kill shots off your YouTube channel? And I was like, We'd be obliged. Hell yeah. So go ahead and take them. So you might see a couple of our clips in there and good on them for using them. So I just feel like this is a premium arrow that's built for hunters. You yeah. know, I I mean, the guys that are shooting X's, they're gonna do all their own stuff right? Mm-hmm. This is just if for the hunter that says, you know what? I'm ready. I've got a really nice bow. I'm ready to complement it with really nice arrows. You don't got to look any further. Yeah. Don't put hub ca- hubcaps on that uh, Cadillac that are plastic. You know what I mean? Whatever that old saying is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our, our journey, I mean, basically it started like you got those flat lines. We shared a bow for several seasons. Um, then we went to the carbon express blue RZ or no, you went to the carbon express reds. Reds. Um, then the blue RZs after that. And And here's here. We'll say this. Like I remember definitively the reason why I switched is because every deer I shot all the time, I broke an arrow every time, every deer I killed them. Right. It's like, okay, don't complain too much. But then it's like, dude, Every deer, mm-hmm. every deer, the arrow, the shaft broke. Yep, sheared off. So then I'm like, okay, screw it. I'm. We went to blood sport for a little while, mm-hmm. and those were very heavy. Oh yeah, they were. They hit fine, and they slobbed right through them too. But like after that, I'm. I started. You know, you start looking and like you said analytical, and I was like, okay, micro diameter shaft, this, that, and the other, and we came up with the arrows that we had been shooting for a while, and they worked great. I think I'm going to finish this before we move on to the Would You Rathers. I think the micro diameter shaft, shaft is a fad right now. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like shiplap for the hunting industry. <laughs> because if you look, the penetrating <sighs> penetration yeah. power really doesn't come from the micro diameter shaft. It's the build. It's the weight. It's your FOC. It's the, the specs of the arrow, not the size of the shaft. Most people hang their head on the fact that, oh, you get less wind drift. Come on, man. I... Yeah, at I'm 25 not yards Morgan. with a whitetail, I'm not taking 100 yard bombs at stuff. Right, right. Like, so yeah. have I shot micro damers? Yes. Have I liked them? Yes. But they're, they're, I'm going to tell you this right now shooting 3D targets and bag targets with micro diameter arrows, which almost all of them require an outsert, is a pain in the ass to pull the arrows out of. Mm-hmm. That is literally why last year I switched to a standard diameter arrow because, like, you have this tiny shaft and you have an outsert that's metal. Great. I like that. Added FOC, protection of the arrow, you name it. I, I'm digging it. And then you shoot them into a target like the self-healing Reinhardt's or oh, a bagged. Yeah. It's like I am pulling and I am not a little dude. Like yeah. Logan can't pull her arrows out of the targets yeah. because that outsert, it's, it's like... It's buried. It's Yeah. It's like putting a barb on the end of your arrow. Yeah. You know, you have this self-healing target that like sucks around it mm-hmm. and you're trying to pull like a, what feels like a lollipop through it, you know? That's a good, yeah. So, analogy. so I, and again, I'm sorry if, if you're a micro guy, sweet. I shot them. I think they work good, but if you're going to try to tell me that they're more accurate than a, than a standard shaft arrow because of less wind drift, I, you're probably right on paper, but man, yeah, come on. It's like anything else. I feel like when you take something to the nth degree, 99% of people aren't going to notice. Like, you know, I really like the advancements that come in the archery world every year. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, like when I'm looking at like comparative models of bows that come out and they're like, yeah, the great axle to axle ratio makes it outstanding for stabilization and, 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 uh, 
you know, everything More about forgiving. the brace. And, you know, I understand that like a shorter brace height, the arrow is going to be in the bow for longer versus a longer brace height. I get all that. I'm. It makes sense to me on paper. But what I'm telling you is that if you're not like in the top 1% of people that are hunting and shooting at great distances, 80, 90, 100 yards, like routinely, like a Levi Morgan type, I just don't think it ver- it matters very much. Nah, man. It, for a Midwest whitetail hunter, that's not going to shoot over 45 yards. I mean, you know what I mean? I shoot, right? But I shoot fur. I I shoot my bow so I can shoot at fur, not at dots. Yep. But all right, getting into would you rather check out the Exodus MMTs. Here we go. Would you rather have an electric bike, whatever brand you want, or like a walk behind brush mower, like a 30 inch deck brush mower? Oh man, that's a hard one. I think I'm going to take the brush mower for now. Because really? I don't at this point uh, have a tractor, and I feel like that would be a good band aid for the time being. Because I feel like you can do a lot with like a DR brush mower. I mean, they're everything awesome. everything a brush so, hog. And I, I just don't mind walking that much at all. Like I, I enjoy walking around out in the woods and stuff like that, and, and stuff. When I have like leisure time, I do enjoy doing that stuff. So I would agree that an e-bike would be much more convenient for hunting season. But I myself, as like a person that wants to dive more deeply into the management kind of world, I would really like to have a DR mower. Yeah. I this was a tough one for me. I I I'm think e-bikes Pro. kind of um Dude. also I don't I don't want to lay my pride down on the line. I'm not a I'm not a, f- a super duper fan of e-bikes in general, but Me neither. And I kind of I gave Jesse so much guff when he got his, but like They're awesome. I I just I've don't think I'll ever at them get one. Because comparatively to a four-wheeler side by side, they're very economical. Like mm-hmm. but yeah, you can do more with the DR management wise, but I think like you could use hours wise more the e-bike yep yep you're probably right uh number two would you rather have a big garage or a big yard man this is tough does yard imply property yeah like land not not, not like land but like like yard like what we kind of have in our setups now the ability mm. to shoot 50 yards with your bow or shoot your you know i don't know man i'm gonna mm-hmm. i'm gonna say garage and I, i'm surprised <sighs> Kind of not. I love my shed, my garage, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But like, I really also like the fact that I can walk outside. What are we qualifying as a big yard here? Like a, a yard where you can shoot a gun a hundred yards or yeah. a bow, like 50, 60, a hundred. Like I'm talking, like I said, range. like the yards that like we have, mm-hmm. like mowed grass yard. Mm. That's what I'm considering a yard. Mm-hmm. Like that you have to, which I hate mowing. Oh my God. I hate yeah, I don't mowing. like it either. I fucking hate it. Sucks. I wish I could find a kid that lived close to me to mow, but even then the hills are treacherous with my zero turn. Like, <laughs> off the side tangent but like i guess i spend more time in my shed especially after the snow comes and like it's crappy out i would say so i'm gonna take this yet i think it would be a different implication if we didn't live in illinois and the weather wasn't bad for six months out of the year but yeah um yeah i would go with the garage as well in that scenario next one would you rather have a gas powered pull saw or a boom sprayer Hmm. <laughs> I think I would rather have the gas powered pole saw in this case and try to get, cause I feel like the most effective food plots that I know of, like, and I'm not trying to make whitetail hunting sound like I'm not trying to dumb it down or put it in layman's terms or anything, but I feel like if you have standing corn and standing beans in Illinois during different parts of the year, those are probably two of the top most um, pretty hard to highly beat. competitive and hard to beat food plots that there are, whether or not it's an actual food plot planted by you or just ag left behind by the farmer for you. So I think that I would rather have the pole saw the, just because, um, you know, we have so many stand locations and we're always moving and bopping around and stuff like that. And, um, that manual one that we have and had, f- had for old ran, I don't even know, two decades pushing, I think, um, you know, there comes a time where even that, like we need that four or five inch limb that's a little too big to snip with that or that's a pain. A Um, big ass pain. Yeah. And so I think I would rather have the gas powered one and then just let my food plots be what they were and get the farmer to leave me some stuff. Yeah. But if I was going to manage like, like we're drilling down hard into like, you know, 240 grass killer arrest slay something where you would like treat a food plot with that's planted by you the boom sprayer would obviously be more effective but i think i would go with the pole saw for now 
gas powered. It's just it's one of those things that you don't realize how nice they are until you have one. Uh-huh. Gas or battery powered. Yeah, because you've got that DeWalt one, and it's awesome. Okay. Uh, what does the next one say? Number four. Would you rather saddle hunt for a year or have a mobile blind? So you still have your stands. When I when I wrote this, I'm going to ask you this one. You can give me five. Um, w- you know, you have your deer stands, but in your tool kit, right, your arsenal, would you rather have a saddle for bebopping around or like, uh, like a redneck blind on a sled? Not a big enclosed blind, but like one that you can pull around. What would you rather have? Do you already have permanent blinds set up? Nope, just stands. Okay, I'm going to take the mobile blind then just because I prefer to be out of a blind for gun season. And that's oh, the only too. reason I'm taking it is just to have that stable shooting platform so we can have, you know, our sticks or the death grip or something in there so we can make like an accurate shot because like if I'm thinking about like if you and I were in a stand the <laughs> night that TJ came out, we wouldn't even been thinking about pulling the trigger. But the fact that you were stable in a blind had multiple points of rest, I feel like that's the reason that I enjoy being in blinds during gun season. So I take the mobile blind and that's probably due to the fact that I'm not like a great saddle hunter i'm probably two out, two out of ten <laughs> we get up the tree we probably look like idiots yeah. but we're like hey we did it we're like Hi, man God, we're we in the tree we cool yes <laughs> mission the conflict like probably I, picked the wrong i tree. will probably. say this if we'd have been in a stand the only stand that was back there on the night that tj walked out i think i could have killed him with a handgun yeah <laughs> yeah it was close he, he would have been really close right right by our stand all right hit me with five uh Oh, this is the one I asked you earlier when we were eating. Would you rather have a dog that tracks deer, blood, scent, whatever, or finds antlers, sheds? No, not even a hard one, a tracking dog. I think... Really? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for anybody that has a shed dog. But it's like, I guess my question for you would be... Would, would you, you rather trust- find a shed or a dead deer that you shot? Yeah, yeah. It's not even I'd that. rather have it's that. It's not even idea. that. It's like... Yeah. If you have a shed dog, it's like, all right, Remington, like, go go shed hunt that patch of grass. Like, are you not gonna walk that? It's purely selfish. I mean, you no, want to pick him up? No, I want to pick him up. I'm not. I'm, do you trust that dog <laughs> enough that he's gonna find every shed and come back? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm thinking you stand like a, at the truck and you send your dog out. Like, the idea of a shed dog to me is just so crazy. Like, I want to know how many sheds a dog finds that you didn't see. Like the mm. the dog retrieves them, for like you. in those thickets where you'd have to bend down like lower than your waist, like a buck path that's like two and a half feet through some brambles and and maybe it's just me. All I'm saying is, if I had a shad dog, I'm not gonna trust him to like, hmm. you know, okay, Fido, go on the other side of the draw. I'm gonna walk this side, and then afterwards, not go walk it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'd rather leave that ninety po- not that ninety inch right side that I can't see laying on the ground for the squirrels to nibble up, even though that would hurt pretty bad, knowing in hindsight that it was there. And I would rather find a dead deer instead of that. That's why I guess why I why I would sway the way of the uh, blood oh, tracking dog. I'm I'm with you tracking yeah. dog for sure. Absolutely. Um, would you rather hunt? No, un- this is for you. Oh, would you rather hunt an ostrich or a kangaroo? Oh man. Well, down under son. just. Just generally speaking, I don't like birds as just a category of animal. Like turkeys are fun, but they're nasty little weird, oh, ugly little bastards. Like I just don't really like birds at all. Uh, I think they're kind of one of, you know, I think they're more or less a nuisance. Maybe that's why I'm not big and hard into waterfowl hunting. But um, so, yeah, I would kill the ostrich because I feel like the uh, kangaroo for me is like that iconic uh, Australian animal and i'm emotionally attached to it just because i feel like it's cool and cartoons are depicting a kangaroo as being like this neat like boxing kicking neat animal whereas an ostrich just for me it's just like a glorified it's a massive 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 fluffy weird faced turkey i'm pretty sure so i would rather kill i think you like what if you hunted ostrich like you hunt turkeys (laughs) you <laughs> set your decoys up. <laughs> this ostrich Master comes in of, full strut, and you have like ostrich. Decoys. You've got like buckshot for instead of like number five shot because yeah. a bird's so fucking big. Yeah, Bam. I wonder what a full grown ostrich weighs. It's got to be. A live They're weight. huge. You should look that up okay. right now. Let's look it up really quick yeah. before we get this over with. I feel like, um, yeah, I would kill the ostrich. I feel like the kangaroo is too iconic for the same reason why I would never shoot a lion in Africa. I'm just a little bit emotionally attached to it. Maybe that's soft. Holy but shit. 
Whoa! So uh, the common ostrich, mother of God, reach six point nine to nine point two feet tall, oh. and weigh up to three hundred and twenty pounds. That is a big bird. That's a big ass bird. Look at them; they're just they're just kind of ugly. And they're fugly so ugly. And, I, you would, I'm assuming yeah. you shoot that with a rifle, like same type of shot you'd take with a turkey on a bow, but with a gun, like right above the leg. Yep. Par- you know, run a run a line through the middle of his body. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I would shoot the ostrich. Yeah, I don't shoot. have a lot of respect for birds. Shoot that son of a bitch. I bet it, I wonder if it tastes like chicken. I don't know. If you've ever had ostrich before, let us know. Um, but anyway, we're happy to be shooting these MMTs. We're excited. Until the next time, do not waste it. <laughs>